Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens, and this lecture, Victorian Poetry Tennyson, is the last in a series of integrity classes for Unit 4 in the course, the Unit on Victorian Poetry, Victorian Poetry Part 1. There will be another unit on later Victorian poetry. Uh, this one is the last in this particular series, and we're going to be looking at Alfred Lord Tennyson. In this lecture, I want to look at the theme of the embowered woman, and this will be as seen particularly in The Lady of Shalott, and also the poem Mariana. We'll look at that theme, and we will look at one of Tennyson's major works, the long series of lyric poems called In Memoriam, In Memoriam A.H.H. -H. We'll be looking at it as an example of elegy. We will be looking at the quality and um, theme of melancholy, also the way in which the poem deals with questions of faith and doubt, and the influence of contemporary science. All three of these, then, being important aspects of this elegy in memoriam. But first of all, let me remind you about Tennyson as a public figure. In an earlier lecture, I mentioned that during his own time, Tennyson was considered to be, by some commentators, by some observers, one of the three most famous people in the world, uh, the other two being Queen Victoria herself and one of her prime ministers, uh, Gladstone. But Tennyson, now imagine that. This is a lyric poet. Lyric poets today, although there are many of them out there, and some very good ones, are not generally celebrities. Tennyson was a celebrity, a public figure in his own day. And why is this important? In order to understand this, we need to look at the importance of the Victorian reader. Since the advent of television in the middle of the 20th century, reading as a form of public entertainment has been in decline. Certainly people still read, and certainly there is still a thriving publishing industry. But think uh, of the typical family entertainment. Starting with television in the middle of the 20th century, families tended more and more to gather around the tube, as we used to call it. Of course, there are many other forms, many other media for entertainment these days, and a lot of us, in addition to TV, watch movies at home and so on. But... Think of a time before television when reading was a major form of entertainment. People read the things that we study now as college subjects, that is, literature. We study novels, we study poetry, and so on, as literature, that is, as a college subject. But back in Tennyson's time, this was, this was entertainment. People didn't have to go to college to read Tennyson. People read Tennyson every day as a form of entertainment. And the fact that he was so popular, so well-known, is an indication of the importance of reading during his own time. So let's look a little bit at some of Tennyson's poems. First of all, what is sometimes called the embowered woman. And the embowered woman or women, I've got the plural here, embowered women were figures of isolation, isolated from, not isolated necessarily literally, they were figures of isolation. This doesn't mean that women during Tennyson's time um, are kept out of society, kept away from public life, and so on. It means in terms of their status, in terms of um, 
their role in society and so on, they are figures of a kind of isolation. In order to understand that, let's begin with this idea of Bauer, because embowered simply means in a Bauer, right? So what is a Bauer? Well, first of all, one of the older meanings of Bauer is that it's a lady's private chamber, as in a bed chamber or a boudoir. Okay, the place that the woman of the house might occupy as her private place. Now, a bower is also a rustic shelter, such as an arbor. That is a little shelter, a little um, lean-to, or perhaps something like a gazebo, something you would find out in the woods. In general, a bower is a place of seclusion, and this is its importance in Tennyson's poems, particularly these two poems that we're looking at here. A place of seclusion, a place where the woman lives and is kept away from the rest of the world. Now that is the image. Okay? What you need to be picturing when you read these poems is the image of a woman who is shut up, secluded, in this chamber, looking out on the world, but not participating. So, let's look at the details, and then let's talk a little bit about what this might signify. Um, first of all, I'd like to just look at this uh, comment that came up in one of the discussions. Somebody wrote of the Lady of Shalott, although there's heavy traffic along the river, no one has seen this lady or knows of her existence. However, the reaper does hear her singing and refers to her as the fairy Lady of Shalott. Now, you might remember that the poem begins with the lines, On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky, and through the fields... The road runs by to many towered Camelot. All right? So there's a river, there are fields, and then there's a road along which we have this heavy traffic. So what does this tell us? Well, this heavy traffic along the river is an image of something else. It's an image of the active life of the world, right? The active world, the public world. And, of course, what's happening here in the very beginning of the poem in these lines that this particular comment refers to is that Tennyson is setting up the contrast between this active public world full of people traveling, going down to Camelot, which, of course, would uh, signify the major city or perhaps even the capital of the kingdom, um, people active, reapers in the fields harvesting the grain, participating in agriculture and so on. And this, of course, contrasts with the status of the Lady of Shalott shut up in her tower. But first of all, let's look at Mariana. Mariana is embowered, that is, shut up in a bower at the Grange. And by the, by the, uh, by the way, the word Grange simply refers to a farmhouse. This would be, like on a farm, would be the major residence of the people living on the farm. So that's where Marianne is. She's out in the country somewhere in this grange, this farmhouse. And what is she doing? She is shut up in this place all by herself she is waiting for her lover. Keep that in mind. Because what Tennyson is drawing upon is the situation in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure in which one of the major characters, Mariana, uh, is supposed to be meeting her lover. And so she has gone to the Grange. This is where they're supposed to meet. She's gone to this 
a secluded farmhouse in order to meet her lover and she is waiting waiting for her lover keep that in mind as the situation now I've chosen uh, one of the stanzas of the poem this I think is the second stanza uh, I've chosen this one in particular because it shows her inside looking out so here's how it goes her tears, of course, Mariana's tears. Why is she crying? Because her lover doesn't come. Her tears fell with the dews at even. That is evening, we would say today. Her tears fell ere the dews were dried. She could not look on the sweet heaven, either at morn or eventide. After the flitting of the bats, when thickest dark did trance the sky, she drew her casement curtain by, and glanced athwart the glooming flats. She only said, The night is dreary. He cometh not, she said. She said, I am a weary, a weary. I would that I were dead. So what we want here is this particular image of the secluded woman looking out looking out from within okay so for example drew the casement curtain window curtain we would say um, right here we see her looking out this is in the evening Let's see. After the flitting of the bats, when thickest dark, this is at night time, okay? Night time. When it's night, she draws the curtain, she looks out of the house, she looks across, that's what a thwart means, she looks across the glooming flats, that is the flat fields outside the house, the farm fields, if you will. And let by the way, let's let's just look really quickly at a, at a couple of other words that you might not be familiar with. Air, old word that means before, um, even tide, of course, evening, flitting of the bats, that should um, trance, entrance, that is to put into a trance, a spell. The night is dreary, he cometh not, I am weary and so on. Okay, I think the language should be fairly clear there. So, image of somebody who at night time draws the curtain and is looking out, waiting for something that does not come. She is the subject here of this not coming. She is, we might say, even the victim. She can't do anything about it. All she can do is wait. Let's look then at the Lady of Shalott. Again, the image of the secluded woman. Here Tennyson talks about the Lady of Shalott. Remember that she is a weaver. So in part two of the poem, there, this is in her tower room, right? So the Lady of Shalott occupies a tower room. We saw Mariana in the farmhouse, we see the Lady of Shalott in a tower room, and there, in that room, she weaves by night and day a magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she stay to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. Let's move on. I've got one more stanza here, I think. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near. Remember that road that goes through the fields along the river? There she sees the highway near winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls and there the surly village churls and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. 
very briefly um, some words here. Churl. Churl would be a laborer, somebody of the lower classes um, in ancient uh, European feudal society. And I think, I think that's probably the only word you might not be familiar with. Now, she sees everything through the mirror, moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her. She is what what she is actually doing is she is weaving tapestries, and what she is weaving into the tapestries are pictures of things in the world outside that she sees through the mirror. But Tennyson represents these as shadows. We might say, well, they're reflections. But in a sense, they are shadows because they are not the real thing, are they? They are just reflections of the world. And that's what she's doing in her tower room. Now, before we go on, let me point out some of the sound effects of this poem. If you remember, in another lecture in this series, I talked about the relationship between poetry and music, and poetry and song, and I said that sound is one of the major characteristics of poetry. It shares that characteristic with song, with music, and so on. Well, look at what Tennyson is doing with rhyme here. All these rhymes are the same. We call them A. All right, A is the first rhyme sound that appears in a stanza or in a poem. And they're all the same. Mirror clear all the year, world appear highway near. And then, that's repeated, this actually would be called B and Camelot, that sound is repeated in Shalot. And then this would be our C rhyme here, and that's repeated. Eddie whirls, village churls, market girls, and so on. All right, what does the repetition of sound like this do? Well, it does a lot of things. Um, some people might say that it creates a certain monotony. Monotony simply means the same sound over and over again. But because the same sound over and over again can be a little tedious or boring, the word monotony has come to mean that. Something that's tedious, boring, monotonous, right? But what is behind this is the idea of a spell. When you keep hearing the same sound over and over and over again, what does it do? It has a tendency to put you to sleep, doesn't it? It creates a spell. And you can see the relationship between this spellbinding sound, if you will, and the subject of the poem. A woman who is under a spell, in the sense of being under a curse, she cannot look out the window. And if you'll remember, we're not going over the entire poem here, but if you'll remember, in the end of the poem, she decides she can no longer not look out the window. She can no longer stay up there just looking at things in the mirror. She has to look out the window, and when she does, the curse comes upon her, and she dies. Not immediately. She dies eventually. But let's look at, this is the last stanza in part two. I just want to look at the first reaction that we actually get from the woman herself. We have the narrator here telling us about the woman, but she doesn't really have a chance to speak for herself, does she? Okay? And so that raises the question, can the woman speak for herself. Is she permitted? And this is the first time in the poem that she actually does speak. So let's listen to her. 
But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed, I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. And the first time she speaks, what is she doing? She is commenting on her situation. She is commenting on her status up here in the bower, her status as an embowered woman, and she is protesting. And, of course, eventually her protest leads her to uh, reject her status, to look out the window. The curse comes upon her, and she dies. Notice also the moment at which she does make this protest. Remember the shadows of the reflections, right? The only way she can participate in the world is through the reflections that she sees in the mirror. And the reflection here that she sees is that of young lovers. And, of course, what this points out to us is that she herself is not given this opportunity to be a lover. She cannot be with somebody else. She is isolated. No opportunity to join with other people, such as the two young lovers joining together, um, the lovers who have lately been married. So what are we to make of all of this? Well, remember one of the major issues of the Victorian era. We've mentioned this before several times, and that is, of course, what the Victorians called the woman question. All of a sudden, people were waking up and saying, you know, we need to pay attention to the status of women. Okay? And, as we sometimes say, women we think, we hope, have come a long way since Victorian times. But it was during Victorian times that the modern world finally decided that they'd better take this seriously and do something about it. This is one way in which we can question the meaning of the embowered woman. Now, here we're going into interpretation. When I was talking about the situation of the Lady of Shalott and what she was doing and so on, I was simply telling you what's literally in the poem. And, of course, we reached that point at which she literally does finally say something. Now we're into interpretation, and there are different ways of understanding this poem. So please don't get the idea that I'm suggesting this is the only way that you can understand it. But we can understand it in terms of the woman question. And I'm just going to mention these things because I do want to get on to In Memoriam. And uh, there's quite a lot I want to say about that. So I'm just going to leave these ideas with you. You can contemplate them yourself. But what do we see in the embowered woman? We see an image of the woman as captive. She is shut up in this place. Right? She can't leave this place. Now, you can say Mariana is there voluntarily. Yes, she's there voluntarily, but she is also captive to her situation. She wants to meet with her lover. She can't do anything about it because she is completely dependent upon him, whether or not he will arrive. So she's captive to the situation in the sense that she can't act. And we see this as well in the image of the woman as an observer rather than a participant. Both of them are observers. Mariana sitting there by the window looking out, waiting for her lover, is an observer. She can't participate. She can't do anything about it. Same with the Lady of Shalott. She observes the world through the mirror, but she cannot participate in the world. And then... The woman is also an object or even perhaps a victim. 
The woman is something that others can see, something that others can interact with, but she can't do anything about it. She's the object, she's the victim of other people's action or lack of action in the case of the lover who never shows up at the Grange, right? So you have these three images of the woman. There is also another theme here that I want to point out, and that is the theme of the artist. Now you can understand the Lady of Shalott as a figure, a representative of the artist. After all, that's what she's doing. She is an artist. She isn't. I mean, she's making pictures. She's not using paint or charcoal or one of those media. She's using tapestry, but she is nonetheless an artist. She makes pictures of the world. And so what this suggests is the idea that there is a sense in which the artist is removed from the world in order to make her art. Obviously, we could say a lot more about that. I just wanted to point these ideas out to you, offer them as food for thought, because we want to go on to In Memoriam. And I've titled this slide The Mournful Tennyson because I'm picking up on another uh, discussion comment. This comment was uh, made in response to Tennyson's uh, poem from the princess called Tears, Idle Tears, and it's another mournful poem. And this uh, student wrote in discussion, this is the second time I've read a poem by mournful Tennyson that had something to do with death but just as the last poem, I don't feel like it's grim and somber, but rather nostalgic and calming. And I think that that is a good description of one of the characteristics of much of Tennyson's poetry. That although it is sad, mournful, right, sad, although it is often sad, it is also calming in a sense. The sound, the um, overall mood of the poem is not particularly violent. So, poetry about death. Well, let's look at In Memoriam. In Memoriam meaning, of course, simply in memory of, and if I were to include the entire title, I'd have included the initials Arthur Henry Hallam. Um, also, I believe the, the full title includes the date of his death, which is 1833, I believe. I'm not sure. But anyway, In Memoriam, a long poem, which is essentially a collection of shorter lyric poems, in memory of Tennyson's good friend, Arthur Henry Hallam. Now, let me just warn you about something here. There is a lot of reference to the love that Tennyson and Hallam had for each other. This does not mean that they were lovers in the sexual sense, as in gay lovers. Um, and it's, it might be easy to get that impression from some of the language that Tennyson uses, and especially from that sense of intimacy with Hallam that he evokes in his poetry. But no, they weren't lovers. They were just very, very close friends. Um, and I believe that Hallam was engaged to um, be married to Tennyson's sister at the time that he died. So, In Memoriam, first of all, is an elegy. An elegy is simply a poem of lament over some loss. In other words, lamenting a loss, usually a person, and also at the same time honoring that person. So an elegy expresses sorrow over the loss. That's where the lament bit comes in, right? and also honors that person, that is, praises that person for um, his or her qualities as a human being. Now, 
The lament theme is captured here. This is from section 27, and I included it uh, not only because it sounds that theme of lament and loss, but also because it contains one of the well-known phrases in the English language. And so Tennyson writes, I hold it true, whate'er befall, I feel it when I, when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. So he's expressing that sense of loss, that sense of sorrow, and by the way, befall. We don't use that word very much anymore. We would say happens. I hold it true, whatever happens. I feel it. I feel this truth. Even when I am most sorrowful about my loss, I would rather have loved this friend of mine. I would rather have loved and lost him than not to have loved him at all. So let's go on. Look at section 55. You've probably noticed, I hope, if you've looked at In Memoriam, and I certainly hope you've looked at In Memoriam, that the individual poems, individual lyric sections, uh, have numbers. I believe there's a total of something like 131 of them in the poem as a whole. It's a long poem. Uh, but In Memoriam is a meditation on several subjects. One of the big ones is Life After Death, because it's a poem about somebody who has died and about Tennyson's experience of that death. So one of the big questions for him is going to be a question that we all ask. Will I be reunited with the people I love after death? Is there life after death? Are they in that life now? Will I be in that life with them when I die? And so on. Now, in raising that question, in meditating upon that subject, Tennyson questions his religious faith and expresses doubt. Doubt over whether there is life after death. And we see this here in section 55. He writes, The wish that of the living whole no life may fail beyond the grave derives it not from what we have, the likest soul, the likest God within the soul. Our God and nature then at strife, that nature lends such evil dreams, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life. Now what the heck is he talking about here? Okay. Now, first of all, he's expressing that wish that we all have, that life will not fail beyond the grave. In other words, that there will be life after death, right? And he's saying, doesn't this wish derive from that relationship that we have with God that we call the soul? God is in the soul, and do we not sense this? Do we not sense the divine life in the soul? And doesn't this tell us that there must be some kind of life beyond the grave? Then he says, but are God and nature then at strife? Well, what does he mean by this? Well, he's saying, you know, if you just look at the world around you, and especially if at a young age you have lost a loved one, you have lost somebody close to you, it seems as though nature just takes life away. In the natural world, in the mortal world, this is what we see. We see death. That's nature. But the God within the soul tells us, no, there is a life beyond the grave. And so he's saying, well, how can there be this apparent conflict between what God tells us and what nature tells us? Nature, that is she, nature seems to be careful of the type. This would be the species. It seems 
Tennyson says, it seems as though nature is careful to preserve the species, but the single life, and of course this would refer to any the loss of any individual, and in particular Arthur Henry Hallam, nature doesn't seem to care about the single life. All she's interested in is preserving the species, where it seems as though the God within the soul is interested in preserving each individual life. So, this religious questioning, the questioning of our faith that there is life beyond the grave. And let's finish section 55 here. He continues, that I considering some that I, considering everywhere her secret meaning in her deeds, and finding that of fifty seeds she often brings but one to bear, I falter where I firmly trod, and falling with my weight of cares upon the great world's altar stairs that slope through darkness up to God. We're going to need to finish the sentence here, right? I stretch lame hands of faith and grope and gather dust and chaff and call to what I feel is Lord of all and faintly trust the larger hope. Quick summary here, what he's saying. Let me go back. I want to capture those words. Yes, this idea here Again, referring to nature. Nature being careless of the individual. Nature might scatter in the field, right? She might scatter as much as 50 seeds to make the corn grow, or the wheat, or whatever it is. And very often, only one of those seeds is going to survive. And when he considers this, he falters. This is an expression of his doubt. Where I firmly trod, you know, right? Firmly treading or firmly walking in the way of faith, well, there was a time, or there are times, when he firmly walks the way of faith, but now he's faltering, he's stumbling. And in his faltering, he stretches the hands of faith. But notice the metaphor here. The hands of faith are now lame. And they only grope. They cannot firmly grasp the belief in that life after death. And he calls to what he feels is Lord of all. He's not certain, right? Lord of all, of course, being God, being the creator of all life. Okay, he calls upon God, but his calling is faint. He faintly trusts the larger hope that there will be a life after death. Let's go on. That was section 55. In section 56, he picks up a theme that he had mentioned in 55. And we have already seen in the idea of the preservation of the species and the way Tennyson regards nature, the idea in science of the evolution. The evolution of life. And he picks up that theme here in section 56. So notice that along with this being a poem that considers the nature of personal loss, right, the loss of Arthur Henry Hallam and the elegiac purpose of the poem, in addition to that and in addition to considering questions of religious faith and doubt, the poem also considers the influence of contemporary science on such questions, questions such as life after death. So, in section 55, he had mentioned that 
Nature is careful of the type. Now he contradicts himself. He says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe she's not so careful after all. So careful of the type, but no. From scarped cliff and quarried stone, she, that's nature, she cries, a thousand types are gone. I care for nothing. All shall go. Thou makest thine appeal to me, I bring to life. I bring to death. The spirit does but mean the breath. I know no more. And he shall be, and we'll continue in a second, but I want to look at what he's saying here. First of all, scarped cliff and quarried stone refers to paleontology. That is, the study of life and the world, the earth itself, as it was in ancient times, prehistoric times. And one of the ways in which this study is conducted by science is by looking at the various strata of the earth that are exposed, right, when you cut through the stone, whether it's the stone of the cliff or stone that you quarry out of the ground, what we see are the various strata. And geologists were starting to tell us, and this is back before Tennyson's time, geologists were starting to tell us, hey, when we look at these different strata, we can see that the Earth is a lot older than we thought it was. And not only that, we start to discover fossils, right? And what do those fossils tell us? Those fossils tell us about these types or species, such as the famous dinosaurs, right? That lived millions of years ago and are no longer with us. They are gone. So, what nature is saying, Tennyson starts to say, well, she seems to be careful of the type. Nature comes back and says, wait a minute. She says, I care for nothing. I don't preserve the, the species. I don't preserve the types. They come and they go. And he says, you, she, I'm sorry, <laughs> she says to him, to Tennyson, you are making your appeal to me? She says, I am the one who brings to life, me, nature. I am the one who brings to death. Things evolve, they become extinct, right? Life becomes extinct. You make your appeal to me, I'm going to tell you, I'm the one who creates, I'm the one who destroys the spirit that you're talking about, the Holy Spirit of God, no. Spirit only means breath. That is, the breathing in and the breathing out of the air that gives the body oxygen, it does not mean that spiritual life in some other plane of being after death. She says, I know no more. So Tennyson continues, And he, shall he, man, all right, we always think of man as being, that is humanity, of course. We think of humanity as being sort of the ultimate creation of nature. Man, her last work, who seemed so fair, such splendid purpose in his eyes, who rolled the psalm to wintry skies, psalm praising God, right? Who built him fanes of fruitless Prayer, a fane is a temple. Who trusted God was love indeed, and love creation's final law. Though nature red in tooth and claw with raven shrieked against his creed. Okay, sin is not finished yet. Shall man, remember this is the question, the question is shall man, who is all of these things here, shall man... Shall man who loved, who suffered countless ills, who battled for the true, the just, be blown about the desert dust, or sealed within the iron hills, 
So what's what's the overall question? Long sentence here, right? But the question is, shall, we would say today, we would say man, we would say something like humanity or humankind, our species, right? Our race, shall humankind just be blown about as dust. Like all of the other species that became extinct, shall man become extinct as well. Right? No more. Shall he become no more? A monster then? A dream? A discord? Dragons of the prime that tear each other in their slime? Were mellow music matched with him. All of these other species, and this would seem to be a reference to the dinosaurs, right? All of these other species that tore each other, um, they would be mellow music compared with man in his final hour. I think there's another... Right, here we go. This is, this is the end of section 56. Tennyson concludes, O oh, life as futile then, as frail, O oh, for thy voice to soothe and bless, what hope of answer or redress behind the veil, behind the veil. Again, that question, what is there? What is there behind the veil? Right? As Paul writes in that famous chapter in 1 Corinthians, Now I look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Well, Paul, of course, believed that after looking through the dark glass of this world, right, behind that dark glass, behind the veil, right, behind the veil there would be another life, and that he, Paul, in that famous passage, is saying, I do expect to be able to see God face to face, but Tennyson is just questioning whether there is going to be an answer behind the veil. One more look at In Memoriam, and then we're finished. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. And getting back to the idea of mournful Tennyson, very, very famous section of In Memoriam, section 7, relatively short, but showing Tennyson as a student of melancholy. It is said that Tennyson understood this particular state of mind that we call melancholy, understood this better than any other poet. So melancholy is that state of mind in which we experience sorrow and loss. Um, probably in our own language today, the most common word we have that would be closest to melancholy would be something like the blues. All right, Tennyson has got the blues here, right? And... I bring this in at the end because I think it's one of the best expressions in Tennyson's poetry of the melancholy that is associated with personal loss. The dark house that he refers to here is the house where Arthur Henry Hallam used to live. Dark house by which once more I stand here in the long, unlovely street. Doors where my heart was used to beat so quickly, waiting for a hand, a hand that can be clasped no more. Behold me, for I cannot sleep. And like a guilty thing, I creep at earliest morning to the door. He is not here, but far away. The noise of life begins again. And ghastly, through the drizzling rain, on the bald street breaks the blank 
day. Tennyson, of course, in the street near the house where he used to meet his friend, where his friend would shake his hand in greeting. There's no point anymore, all right? The street now is unlovely in the absence of Hallam, and there is nothing for him but the drizzling rain and the blank day. Images then, images of sorrow, images of melancholy, images of loss. And look at the way Tennyson uses that famous uh, feature of poetry, alliteration, on the bald street breaks the blank day. It's kind of like the sound of that last line is kind of like the door shutting in Tennyson's face. His friend is gone. Well, that's all, folks. And this uh, concludes a series of lectures on uh, Victorian Poetry Part 1. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please ask them in discussion, and I will see you online.